Hi, this is the NCFE Functional Skills Level 2 Maths Practice Paper 1260 and we're going to start with the non-calculator section. Activity 1, Knitting. Jyoti works in a knitting shop. The shop sells knitting charts like the one below. Knitting is made from rows of stitches. The symbols in the chart tell knitters what type of stitch to use. The chart is a coordinate grid. Let's have a look. Here we go. We've got our rows down here. These are the different type of stitches we've got to do. First part. Tick the symbol which is in stitch 5, row 13. Okay, well, let's move this down a bit. So stitch 5, so here are the stitches, this is stitch 5, row 13, so we're going to go up. So, and it's going to be this one here. In fact, if we use my ruler, we can see we're going up from stitch 5 and across from row 13. So this symbol we've got, sort of, can never remember if it's a backslash or forward slash, but it's going from top left to bottom right, which is this one here. One B. Here is a different knitting chart. That's very pretty. This chart tells knitters what colour wool to use for each stitch in the pattern. Jyoti changes the chart. She adds four more blue stitches to give the pattern four lines of symmetry. Write down the coordinates of the four blue stitches Jyoti adds. Right. Well, to get four lines of symmetry, so remember a line of symmetry is like a mirror line, a line, straight line that goes through something, which means that it splits the piece into two equally reflective parts. So for example, much easier with an example. If we've got a line straight down the middle, if we had a mirror here, the left side would be reflected into this. Okay. Now, they have said that there's four squares missing, so we're going to fill those in, but first of all, we're going to work out where those lines of symmetry would have to be. So, the other place we could have a line of symmetry is across the middle. And also I know that with a square, you've got exactly four lines of symmetry. And that is horizontal, vertical, and the two diagonals. So one there, and a final one from up here, down to here. Right, so they said we needed to add four more patterns. So we've got to see where... Is it not the same at the moment when it's reflected? Well, this blue bit here is reflected to this blue bit, which is fine. This blue is reflected to that blue. But if we look on the diagonal, if we've got a blue here, we should also have a blue this other side of the diagonal. Okay, now you can see they match. And similarly, up in this corner, we should have this one coloured in. So now this should all match. So we're looking for reflection in every line of symmetry. So in the vertical line, in the diagonals, in the horizontal. So we put these two squares in here. We need to have matching squares down in here. And follow it down in here. Okay. Now they haven't actually asked us to fill them in, but I think it's much easier to colour them in and then do the bit that they've asked, which is write down the coordinates of the four blue stitches. So, we want stitch and row. Let's start with this one. This is stitch 13, row 1. And then if we go up, we've got another stitch 13, row 15. So now we've got these two over here. We've got stitch 3, row 1, and then we've got the one up here, which is stitch 3, row 15. Okay. 
Gavin goes to Joe T's shop. He is making a circular blanket. The finished blanket will have a radius of 0 0.325 metres. It will have ribbon all around the edge. He thinks he will need 2.5 metres of ribbon. Gavin knows that pi is about 3.1416. Round pi to one decimal place and use this value to work out how much ribbon Gavin will have left if he buys 2.5 metres. Right, okay. Well, the first thing I'm going to do they want is to do some rounding. Even if I don't know how to do any of this, they've told me that we need to round pi. So pi, if I round it to one decimal place, well, the first decimal place is the one. So I look at the next digit. Four, well, it's less than five. So we're just going to keep it as 3.1. And I can put to one decimal place. Okay, that's the first bit. Right, now we're talking about how much ribbon to go around the edge. So that's the circumference that we're interested in. Well, the circumference, or C, can be calculated as 2 pi r, which means 2 times pi, which we've got as 3.1, times r, which is the radius, and we've been told that the radius is 0 0.325. Okay, right, so we want to multiply these together. So which order shall we do it? Well, uh, I'm actually going to multiply... Now, you could do this in any order. I'm going to multiply the 2 by the 0 0.325 first. Now the reason is that I know that 2 times 5 is 10. So I'm going to, instead of having 3 digits here, I'll end up with 2 digits. So let's, let's have a look at that. So if we do 2 times 0 0.325, let's start off by just doing 2 times 325. Okay, so 2 times 5 is 0. Sorry, 2 times 5 is 10. 0 carry the 1. 2 times 2 is 4. Add the 1 is 5. 2 times 3 is 6. Now, we had 3 decimal places here, so we need to go 1, 2, 3. So we end up with 0 0.65. 0. Okay? Right, now you'll see that because although it was 0 0.650, we can actually ignore that 0 at the end now. And we've just got 0 0.65. We now need to multiply that by the 3.1. So again, I'm going to ignore my... Oh, I was going to. I'm going to ignore my decimal places. And we'll just do 31 times 65. Now, you don't have to multiply using the column method. You could do uh, 31 times 10 and do six lots of that and then half, but I'm going to do it this way. So 5 times 1 is 5. 5 times 3 is 15. So 5 carry, uh, we don't need to carry the 1, we can put it down. Now we move on to the 10s. So we don't need any units. 6 times 1 is 6. 6 times 3 is 18. And we need to add these together. 5 plus 0 is 5. 5 plus 6 is 11, 1 plus 8 is 9, and the 1 is 10, and 1 plus 1 is 2. Now we've got to put our decimal point back in again. Now, 3.1, that had one decimal place, so we move it in 1. Then the 0 0.65 had two decimal places, so we move it 2. So we actually end up with 2.015. Okay. Now, if we shift this up a little bit here. Now, the original question said that Gavin thinks he'll need 2.5 metres of ribbon. Uh, work out how much ribbon Gavin will have left if he buys 2.5 metres. So he buys 2.5 metres, but he actually only needs 2.015. So to find out how much is left over, we take away one from the other. Now, we've got nothing to take these away from. 
So I'm going to put some zeros in. I've not changed the number, but now I've got something to work with. Zero take away five, I can't do it. So I need to borrow a one. Well, I can't get a one from here. So I'm going to take one from the five. That becomes a four and I pass the one across. I still want to pass it over here. So I'm going to reduce the 10 to a nine and pass one over. So I've now got 10 minus five, which is five. Nine minus one, which is eight. Four minus zero, which is four, for the decimal point, and two minus two, which is zero. So our final answer is 0 0.485, and they've already put the meters in for us. One D. Sheba also goes to Joti's shop. She is knitting a rectangular cover for a large storage box. Okay, and we can see the uh, storage box is one meter across, 0.8 meters deep, and 0.6 meters high. Calculate the length and width of the cover required to cover the box, as shown in the diagram. Right now. This might not be as straightforward as it first looks. You've got to, if it's going to cover this box, and you can see it's coming down to the floor. So if you imagine, just doing a little sketch, we're going to have the top of the box in the middle. This is our one meter. And down this way, it's going to be 0 0.8 meters. Now, the blanket is actually, or, or whatever it is, the cover, needs to go this way as well. And it's got to go 0 0.6 metres down to the floor. So we're going to have another 0 0.6 down to there. Okay. Now, it's also got to go down to the floor this way. So we're going to have another 0 0.6 metres coming out on the side, like this, okay. So if that's, we've got the cover dropping down at the back, we've got the cover dropping down at the front. So we're also going to have 0 0.6 meters coming down this way. And that means that we've also got the cover dropping down on the left, and it's going to drop down again by 0 0.6 metres. Okay. Now, I've shown it just with the flaps here, like the, the front and the back and the sides, but it's going to be a rectangular cover. So we actually are going to need it to go all the way up to the corners. Okay, so if you can imagine, we've got a rectangular cover. We'll put it on top, it will cover the top, and then it will drop down, cover the back, the front, and the two sides. And it's going to just sort of gather. It'll be sort of a bit ruffled up in the corners. So, what's the total length? Well, it's gonna be 0 0.6 plus one meter, Plus 0 0.6. So we've got 0 0.6 and another 0 0.6 and 1 meter. 6 and 6 is 12, carry the 1, 1 and 1 is 2. So the length will be 2.2 meters, we can put down here. And the width going down this way, where we've got 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and another 0 0.6. 0 0.6. Uh, I'll do the two 0 0.6s first, and the 0 0.8. 6 and 6 is 12, and 8 is 20. So 0 carry the 2, 0, 0, 0, and 2. So we've got a length of 2.2 .2 metres and a width of 2.0, or we could just put 
two meters. One e. Knitting needles are long. Uh, sorry, knitting needles are long, thin cylinders with a point at one or both ends. The size of a knitting needle is the diameter of the cylinder in millimeters. So, in other words, uh, these needles have a diameter of two and a quarter millimeters. So that's going across there. Right. Calculate the difference in diameter between six and a half millimeter needles and three and three quarter millimeter needles. Give your answer as a mixed number. Well, what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to turn these into improper fractions. So six and a half. Well, to turn it into an improper fraction or a top heavy fraction, do the whole number times the denominator. So six times two is 12. Add on the numerator. So it's 13 and it's going to be 13 halves. Now let's do the same with the three and three quarters. So three and three quarters. I'll do three times four is 12. Add the three is 15. So it's going to be 15 quarters or 15 over four. Now they want the difference between them. So, well, we know this is the bigger number. So what we want is we want 13 over two minus 15 over four. Well, at the moment we can't do this because we've got different denominators, but two goes into four. So that means we can rewrite this first fraction as a fraction with a denominator of four. Okay, so this is getting our common denominator. So the reason we want this is because then if we've got the same denominators, we can do our subtraction nice and easily. Now, to get from two to four, we're doubling that. So we need to do the same thing to the top. So two times 13 is 26. So we've not changed the value of the fraction because we've doubled the top and the bottom. So 13 over two is the same as 26 over four. If you don't believe me, type it in your calculator and you'll see they both give you 6.5 as a decimal. But now what this means is we can keep the second fraction as it is because we've already got a denominator of four. And we want 26 quarters, take away 15 quarters. So we're gonna keep the quarters or the four 26 minus 15 is 11. Now, just sneaked on here is give your answer as a mixed number. So if we want a mixed number, well, first of all, we say, well, how many times does four go into 11? Well, four, eight, 12 would be too many, so it's just gonna be twice. And how many are left over? Well, two fours were eight, so then we've got nine, 10, 11. So that's three quarters remaining. One F. The old world record for the longest knitting needles was 3.98 meters. The new world record is 11% longer. What is the new world record for the longest knitting needles? Right, okay. So if we think 3.98, that's the current record. So that's like, that sort of relates to 100% really. If we want 11% more, well, first of all, let's work out what 10% is. So I'll go over here. For 10%, we're just going to move the decimal point once to the left. So 10% will be 0 0.398. And for 11%, well, we need another 1%. So it's like we're dividing by 10 again. So we're going to move that decimal point one more. So we get 0 0.0398. Okay. Uh, so if we want the new world record, so in other words, we want the original 100% plus the 10% and plus the 1%. Okay. Actually, if I do the 100 over here, you'll see that if we add these all together, we get 
so increased by 11%. So we need to do the same with these. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, I should have lined these up slightly better. Let's put a zero there, and a zero there, and a zero there. So what I've tried to do is get the same, so I've got all my units, tenths, hundredths, thousandths, and tens of thousandths. So when we add them all up, 0 plus 0 plus 8, just 8. 0 plus 8 plus 9 is 17. 7 carry the 1. 8 plus 9 is 17, plus 3 is 20, plus 1 is 21. 9 plus 3 is 12, plus 2 is 14. 4 carry the 1, put a decimal, and 3 plus 1 is 4. Okay, so yeah, if you want to write this, just, just line them up a bit better than I did there. But you should be able to see that we get our new answer here, and that's all in metres. One G. The relative thickness of wool can be described using improper fractions. Put these improper fractions in order of size, starting with the smallest. Okay, well... Two ways of doing it. One would be to uh, get a common denominator. So we can look for a number that all three of these go into. I'm actually going to do it slightly differently. I'm going to... I'm going to do it using the bus stop method. So three divided by two. So two goes into three once. But we've got one remainder. So what I'm going to do is instead of 3, we make it 3.0 because that now gives us somewhere to put our remainder. So now we say how many times is 2 going to 10? Well, that's 5. So we've got that 3 over 2 is the same as 1.5. Now let's try with 7 divided by 4. So we put 7 inside the bus stop and 4 on the outside. Now, because I sort of know what's coming next, I'm going to put a zero afterwards. And say 4 into 7 goes once, with 3 remainder. Put the decimal. 4 into 30, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, that's 7. But we've got 2 left over. So I'm going to give myself another 2, sorry, another zero, so I can put the 2 in front of it. And how many 4s go into 20? 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, that's 5. So we've got that 7 over 4 is equal to 1.75. And you'll see that once we've got the third one as a decimal, it's going to make it uh, nice and easy for us to order them. So 5 divided by 3. So 3 on the outside, 5 on the inside. 3 goes into 5 once, remainder 2. So give ourselves a zero to put the two and a decimal point here. Three into two goes three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one would be too many, so it's going to be six and uh, two left over. Now, we're going to have something else up here, but I can actually stop here because... I can see, well, if it's 1.6, it doesn't matter what the other numbers are. It's going to be in between these two numbers. So if we're starting with the smallest, this must be the smallest. So it's 3 over 2. Then the next smallest is going to be 5 over 3. And then the biggest is 7 over 4. So say, if you want to carry on with this, you can say 3 into 20, go 6, remainder 2. But you should see that actually this is going to recur forever. So you'll just keep getting lots and lots of sixes. But as soon as we can see, well, actually, I know it's between these two, we can stop. We don't need to know the exact answer. One H. Josie and her friends knit squares to make patchwork blankets. It takes four people 20 days to knit enough squares for one blanket. How long would it take eight people if they knit at the same rate? Well, there were four people here. If we've got twice as many people, it's going to take half the time. 
So it's just going to be 20 days divided by 2, which is 10. And that's the end of section A. This is NCFE Functional Skills Maths Level 2. It's the practice paper 1260. And now we're on to the calculator section. Activity 2, basketball. 2A. Lottie plays basketball. She does some shooting practice. She takes 75 shots. 33 of these shots go in the basket. What percentage of her shots go in the basket? Well, it's 33 out of 75. To turn it into a percentage, we multiply it by 100. And we can use our calculator. So 33 out divided by 75. We can do it equals times 100. And we get 44. Two B. The table shows the number of points Lottie scored in games seven to twelve this season. Her median score for these games is twenty five percent higher than her median for games one to six. After game six, Lottie's dad said that he would increase the money in her money box by twenty percent each time she scored more than her median for the first six games. Lottie started with £50 in her money box. How much money will she have after game 12? Right, OK, quite a bit to do there. Uh, so we've got to work out what the, her median was for the first six games, first of all. Now we know that the median for these games is 25% higher than it was at the first. So we can work out what the median is for these games and then reduce it or sort of take off 25%. Okay, so let's work out what her scores were. So I'm going to write them in order, the scores. So we had a 6, then we had another 6. What's the next smallest? Then we had a 10, then another 10, and a 12, and a 14. So to work out the median, we cross off the smallest and the largest, and we keep doing that. And we've got two in the middle. Normally, if you've got two in the middle, you add them together and divide by two, but they're the same. So our median is just 10. And I'm going to put median for games 7 to 12 equals 10. Right, we want to know what the median was in games 1 to 6. Right, now, we know that her median increased by 25%. So that's like saying that the median of 10 actually represents 125% of the original median. So to find out what the original median was, we need the 10, we need to divide it by 125 to almost find out what 1% is and then multiply it by 100. So that's, it's not taking off 25% because that wouldn't be the same. We want to go back as if 25% had never been added. So we do our 10, divide by 125, multiply it by 100 and we get 8. So this is the median, and that's for games 1 to 6. Okay. So, why are we doing all of this? Well, after game 6, Lottie's dad said he'd increase the money in her money box by 20% each time she scored more than her median for the first 6 games. Well, her median was 8, so how many times did she score more than 8? One, two, three, four. So we've got to multiply it by 20% four times. Right. So she starts off with 50 pounds. If we're going to multiply it by 20%, sorry, increase it by 
That's the same as multiplying it by 1.2, or I'll do it as 1.20. So you can see this is like the 20%. You could work out 20% and add it on, but you're going to have to do this four times because we've got four times where she scored more than eight. And shall I write that down here? So scored more than eight in four games. So we're going to multiply it by 1.2, so we're going to increase it by 20%. Then do it again. Then do it again. Then do it again. So increasing by 20% once, twice, three times, four times. If you've got a scientific calculator, you could do it as 1.2 to the power of 4. But we don't need a scientific calculator. We can literally type it in the way I've written it out. So 50 times 1.2 equals times 1.2 equals, that's twice, times 1.2, that's three times, and one more time. And we get that that equals 103 pounds and 68 pence. Not bad. To see. A player's true shooting percentage for a game is calculated using the following formula. So TS percent, true shooting percentage, equals 50p, so 50 times p, and that's all over 0.44f plus a, where p is the total point scored, f is the number of free throw attempts, and a equals the number of other goal attempts. In her last game of the season, Lottie scored a total of 15 points, attempted 8 free throws, and made 17 other goal attempts. Use the rule to calculate Lottie's true shooting percentage for this game. So, basically we can say, well, this is equal to, well, 50 times P, the total points scored, and that was 15. So 50 times... 15. That's all over. And we've got 0 0.44 times F. F is the number of free throws. So 0 0.44 times 8. And then we add on the other goal attempts. So 17. So I'm just going to do this step by step. So 50 times 15 is 750. And I'd recommend doing this step by step and not just putting it all in a calculator. Then you can see if there's any mistakes. So then we've got 0 0.44 times 8. So remember our bid mass rules. We're doing the multiplication up here first. That's all above the line, so it's like that's in brackets. Then we do the multiplication down here, 3.52. And then we've still got the 17 to add on. So although division comes first, because this is above the division sign, it's as if this is in brackets. So we need to add on the 17. So we end up with 750 divided by 20.52. So 750 divided by 20.52, which gives us a percentage of 36 point and what should we round? It doesn't tell us what to round it to. So I think I'll round it to two decimal places. So five, four, but this is a nine, so we're going to increase that to 36.55%. Okay. 2D. Lottie reads that the best angle to launch the ball uh, to launch the ball from for free throws is 50 degrees. Calculate the angles A, B and C. Well, this tells me that it's a right angle. So I know a right angle is 90 degrees. So this must be 90 minus 40. So that's actually going to be 50 degrees. 
Now, this one, well, this isn't a right angle, this is a straight line. I know the total of that is 180 degrees. So 180. Now, we've got this angle's 35, and this one's 65. So if we take those away from 180, we'll be left with angle B. So we get 180 minus 100. So this must be 80 degrees. You can use a calculator if you, if you need to. Now, finally, for this one here, we've got a triangle. And I know that all the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So we could do similar to what we did in B. So we're going to do 180, so the total, and we're going to take away these two angles. So 65 plus 65, which gives us 180 minus, well, 65 plus 65 is 130. Again, you can use your calculator, take them away, and we get 50 degrees. And they tell us to tick the ones which are 50 degrees. Well, that was A, not B, but it was C. But A and C. Two E. This is a scale drawing of a basketball court. The scale is one to four hundred. So that means one centimeter on the drawing equals four hundred centimeters in real life. The diameter of the center circle on the diagram is zero point nine centimeters. Put that on there. Work out the actual area of the center circle in meters squared. Right. So, the area, well, for the area of a circle, we need to use the formula pi r squared. But they want it in meters squared. So, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to convert this first to get it into meters, and then I'll put it in my formula. Okay, always best to do that, uh, to do that first. So, right, if we've got 0 0.9 centimetres on here, to turn it into real life, we need 0 0.9 times 400. Here's my calculator. And we get 360 centimetres. Now, that is the diameter. We want the radius. So radius, the radius is half the diameter. So it's 360 divided by 2. You can use your calculator, but you're going to get 180 centimetres. Now, they wanted the area in metres. Now, I know that there are 100 centimetres in 1 metre. So if we do 180 divided by... 100. We've got two zeros, so that's the same as moving the decimal point twice. So we're going to get 1.8 meters. Again, you can use a calculator for these bits, but I think it's useful to see how we're, when we're multiplying and dividing by hundreds or thousands, then it's, it's easy to do it without. Right, now we can put this into our formula. So we've got the area of the circle. Pi, they've told us we can use 3.14. And we're going to multiply that by the radius squared. So that's 1.8. And squared means times itself. So again, don't worry if you haven't got a scientific calculator with a squared button. We don't need it. So we can do 3.14 times 1.8 times 1.8. And we get 10.1. 36 meters squared. Now we could round it if we want to, but I'd probably leave it as it is, to be honest. They haven't asked us to, to round it. To F. There are 15 players in Lottie's basketball team. 
The table shows information about the players. So we've got height, and we've got it split into under 1.65 meters, 1.65 to 1.8 meters, and over 1.8 meters. And we've got their position on the court. Now, we don't need to know what this means, we just know that they're playing in different positions. So the centers, it looks like the centers are probably the taller people and the forwards maybe, and the guards look slightly shorter. We've got some under 1.65 meters. Okay. Uh, the coach chooses a forward at random to take a shot. What is the probability that the player chosen is over 1.8 meters tall? Give your answer as a fraction and as a decimal. Right, probability, it's always best to start off writing it as a fraction anyway. So, he chooses a forward. So how many forwards have we got? Well, zero, five, and three. So we've got eight altogether. What's the probability that they're over 1.8 meters tall? Well, only three of them are. So it's gonna be three over eight. Now to turn it into a decimal, you can just type it straight into your calculator. 3 divided by 8, and you get 0.375. Activity 3, Road Safety. 3a. Jed is 65 years old. He drives a car but thinks his eyesight is not as good as it was. The scatter diagram shows the relationship between the ages of drivers and the maximum distances at which they can read road signs. So let's have a look at this. Okay. Right. So we've got maximum distance at which signs can be read in feet going up here. And we've got age and years going along here. So, for example, if we pick this value, this is saying that for someone who is 33 years old, the maximum distance at which they could read a sign was 420 feet. Okay, and we've got a different cross for each observation, each person. Okay. Now, the question is what fraction of the drivers over 60? can read a road sign at over 400 feet. All right. So we're only interested in the drivers over 65. So I'm going to draw a line from 65 here. Okay. Well, first of all, if we've got a fraction of the drivers over 65, well, then that means that our denominator is going to be the number of people over 65. So one. Two, three, four, five, six, uh, where are we? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So our denominator is going to be twelve. And we want to know the drivers that can read a road sign at over four hundred feet. Well, this is the four hundred line, this one here. So the only ones above this line are one, two, three. So we've got 3 over 12, which we can simplify down to 1 quarter. Okay, now we've got 3b. And we can have it here as well. Jed says, using the scatter diagram... Oh, bring it down so we can see the question. Jed says, using the scatter diagram, I predict that between the ages of 25 and 65, the maximum distance at which people can read a sign reduces by over 50 metres. Is Jed's prediction reasonable? Use the scatter diagram in 3a to show how you decide. And use the conversion 1 metre equals 3.28 feet. Okay, right. So, I predict that between the ages of 25 and 65, the maximum distance reduces by 50 metres. So we want to look at how far people can see signs at 25 years old and how far they can see it at 65 years old. So let's go back to our graph. Okay. Right. Now, so these are the, our line at 65. So let's also put a line at 25. 
Now, the thing is, we can't just pick any of these values on here, although it happens that one value is on the 25-year line. But we, because we've got a scatter diagram, what we need to do is draw a line of best fit. So that means we do a nice straight line which follows the overall sort of trend or, or shape of the, uh, of the data, but nice straight line. And we want roughly the same number of crosses one side of the line as the other. So this seems to be the general sort of pattern that we've got, I suppose. Uh, where are we? We're talking something like this, and we want to get the same number of crosses above as below. So maybe something, let's try something like this. So it's got to be a nice straight line. And there we go, we've got some values down here, but then we've got some above, some up here and some below. Now we've got our line of best fit. We were interested in the distance people can see at 25 and 65. So at 25, let's read off here. Right. Well, if this is 500 and that's 600, then these little squares must be going up in 20s. So 520. This must be 540. Okay. Now let's do the same at 65. So here, if we read across, here, well again if these are 20s and we've got 320, 340, 360, this must be 380. Right, so let's go back to the actual question. So. I predict that between the ages of 25 and 65, the maximum distance at which people can read a sign reduces by over 50 metres. Well, first of all, we've got the measurements we've read off this graph are in feet. So, at 25 years old, we had 540 feet. And at 65, what did we have? We had 380 feet. So if we take one away from the other, zero, well, we can do it with a calculator, so I won't bother uh, doing it too carefully, but we get 160, that's feet. Now, he was talking about measurements in meters, so we need to convert this from feet into meters. Well, if one meter is 3.28 feet, to get this to meters, we need to do 160 divided by 3.28. And we get 48.78 meters. Well, that's less than 50 meters. He thinks it'll be over 50 meters, so is his prediction reasonable? Well, we can just say no, because it's less than 50. You could argue it's close to 50, but it's much easier with these questions to just say, well, he said over 50, it's not over 50, therefore we'll just give it a no. Right. 3C. The Department of Transport Survey collected data on the percentages of cars travelling at different speeds on a motorway. The table shows the results of this survey. So between 40 and 50 miles per hour, there were four cars, sorry, 4% 4 of the cars. Between 50 and 60%, there were 13% of the cars. Between 60 and 70%, there were 36% of the cars. And between 70 and 90 uh, miles per hour, there were 47 of the cars. Work out an estimate for the mean speed. Well, if you remember, mean is the total divided by the frequency or how many. Okay. So the total is going to be the total speeds. Well, 
We don't know what speed these were going at. We just know it was somewhere between 40 and 50 miles an hour. So what we're going to do, and the fact that they say work out an estimate, this estimate refers to the fact that we're going to use a midpoint. So we're going to assume that all the cars between 40 and 50 miles per hour were going half at the speed halfway between the two. Now, you can look at it and sort of almost work out, well, what's halfway between 40 and 50, and you might be able to see that it's 45. Or if you want to check, you can say, well, let's add the two together. So 40 plus 50 gives you 90, and then divide it by two to get 45. So either way is fine. So I know that between, halfway between 50 and 60, I can use my calculator again, or I can say, well, that's 55. Halfway between 60 and 70 is 65. And then make sure we don't get caught out here. These have all been an interval of 10, but this is actually 20. So halfway between 70 and 90 is going to be 80. Okay. Right. So this midpoint sort of relates to like one car. So this, this is for the range. But there were 4% of the cars in this range. So we're going to do uh, cars times midpoint. So this is giving us like the total speed of all the cars in the range. So we're going to do four times 45. And we can use a calculator, but I know that one's gonna be 180. And we're gonna multiply all of these together. I'll do this one with my calculator, 13 times 55. We get 715. We've got 36 times 65 gives us 2340. And we've got uh, 47 times, what's that, times 80 gives us 3760. So this is like the total speed of all the cars in this range. We want the total total, so the total speed of all of the cars. So we need to add these up. So 3,760 plus 2,340 plus 715 plus 180. And we get 6,995. Now, we need how many? We need our frequency. Well, with this one, it's, it's, this is our sort of frequency column. So we want the total of these. They have told us it's percentage, so I'm expecting this to add up to 100, but let's double check. 4 plus 13 plus 36 plus 47 gives me 100. Okay. So the mean is going to be 6,995 divided by 100. Well, we can use our calculator, or if we're dividing by 100, we're going to move the decimal point twice. So we're going to 69.95. And that's in miles per hour. Three D. Some drivers driving over the speed limit are invited to go to a speed awareness course instead of getting penalty points. There is a maximum speed at which a person can drive and be invited to a speed awareness course. This speed is given by this formula. M equals one point one L plus 9. Where m is speed in miles per hour and l is the speed limit. Calculate m when l equals 30 miles per hour. Okay, so we want to work out m. We know it's 1.1. When we've got a number next to a letter, it means that we multiply them. So l is 30 in this case. And then we're going to add on 9. So 1.1 times 30 gives us 33. And no, I'm just doing this one step at a time. I'm not adding on the nine straight away. Because when you've got a formula, it's much uh, clearer. And also, you're less likely to make a mistake if you just do one thing at a time. Then we can do 33 plus 9, which you can use your calculator. Or you can just do it in your head. So we've got 42 miles per hour. Three E. 
The table shows the number of people attending speed awareness courses each year from 2014 to 2018. So in 2014 there were 1,355,796 people and so on for the other years. Jed says the mean number of people attending each year for 2000 to, sorry for 2017 and 2018 is over 3% higher than the mean number for 2014 to 2016. Is Jed right? Right, so we've got to work out two means. So we work out a mean for these two years and a mean for these three. So remember the mean is the total I'll write it again. Total and this time I will write frequency. So we're going to add these up. One, three, five, five, seven, nine, six, plus one, four, zero, three, five, five, five plus one three nine zero eight eight zero and we get the grand total of four one five zero two three one I'm going to put my commas in I prefer to have commas with these numbers I think it makes it much easier to see okay and the frequency well we're interested in three years so we're going to divide this by three And we get one three eight three four one zero point three. Let's put the commas in. Yeah. Now we want the mean for these two years. So we're going to do our one four one three five nine eight plus one four four five eight one seven equals. So we get two eight five nine four one five. And it's only two years we're interested in. So we've just got a frequency of two this time. And we get one, four, two, nine, seven, zero, seven, point five. Okay, so it has gone up, but he said the mean number is over three percent higher. Well, let's see. What we could do, we can do it two ways. We can either increase this by three percent and then compare it to this number, or we can actually work out what the percentage increase is. So I think I'll do it that way. I'm going to do 1429707.5 divided by 1384103.3. And to turn it into a percentage, I'm going to multiply it by 100. Okay. So we've already got the first number in there. Let's divide that by 1384103. Then multiply it by a hundred, and we get a hundred and three point. I'll do it to two decimal places. Three, three, four. But this is higher than a five, so we'll round that up to three, five. Okay, so this is saying it's a hundred and three point three five percent. So in other words, the increase is the three point three five percent bit. 3.35 is more than 3%. So is Jed right? Yes, he is. Okay. Activity 4, printing. Rani is on placement at a printing company. The company has an order for some leaflets. Each page will have a rectangular area of text with a two centimetre margin around it. So that's two centimetres, that's two centimetres, all the way around, we've got two centimetres. The printer can fit an average of 3.9 words of text per centimetre squared. There are 2,000 words in total. Let's shift up. What, uh, where are we? What is the minimum number of pages that the printer needs? Okay, you must show you're working. Right, so the number of words depends on the area. Okay, the area for this, well, we know the full area of the rectangle, but we've got to allow for the margin. Well, if this is 13 centimeters, we've got to take off a margin of two centimeters here 
and another two centimeters here. So we end up with nine centimeters. And if we're looking at the length, we need to take off two centimeters there, and then another two centimeters there. So we end up with 16 centimeters. So that means that the total area, so area of text, is going to be 9 times 16. Because so we know the area of a rectangle is the length times width. So 9 times 16 gives us 144 that's centimeters squared. Right, the printer can fit an average of 3.9 words of text per centimeter squared. So that means that on one page, we can get 3.9 times 144 words. Which is 561.6 words. Okay. Uh, there are 2,000 words in total. What's the minimum number of pages the printer needs? Okay, well, I'm, I'm actually going to, I don't want my words to run over to the next page. So I'm going to say it's 561 words. So 2,000, the total words. If we divide that by the number of words on one page, that will tell us how many pages we need. So 2,000 divided by 561 gives us 3.5 I'll round that up 3.57 pages but of course you can't have 0.57 of a page so we're going to need four pages B. Another leaflet is folded like this. So we've got our big sheet. This is folded in, probably to about here, and this is folded into there. What is the maximum number of printed pages that a leaflet can have? Okay, well, if we consider the outside of the leaflet first of all, we've got sort of one page here, two pages here, and then we've got one on the back. So we've got page three there. But then if you open it up, we're going to have four. Page four would be on the back of this sheet. Page five would be on the back of this one. And six would be six would be on the back of this grey sheet. So we've got a total of six. Four C. The printer offers two discounts. We've got offer A. Buy two boxes of leaflets, get the third box half price, or offer B five percent off the total price. A customer wants to buy three boxes of leaflets. Which offer is cheaper for the customer? Show how you decide. Okay. So Let's see. So we don't know anything about our boxes. We don't know how much they are. So you look at this and you think, oh, I need some numbers to work with. Well, we can we can sort of work with our percentages. So if he's buying three boxes of leaflets, let's call it like, uh, I'm going to call it, we'd say that one, one box. So let one box. Be one hundred percent, okay. Or just, or you can think of it as just one one hundred, okay. So if he wants three boxes, that's going to be three hundred. Now, if he's getting the third box half price, well, he's actually only going to have to pay. It's like he's getting one box for a hundred percent another box for 100% and the third box only for 50%. So in total 
that's 250. So this is offer A we're doing. Okay. And then if we think about offer B down here, well, we've got 300 in total and we want 5% off. Well, if we work out 5% of 300, we can do 5 out of 100 times 300 to work out 5%. Uh, was it 5 divided by 100 times 300? So we get that 15 relates to 5%. If it's 5% off, well then we need 300 minus 15, which would be 285. So we can say that 250 is less than 285. So A is cheaper. Okay. Now I've done it with hundreds because I was thinking in terms of percentages. You could just think of it in terms of boxes. So you could do something similar. Instead of 100, 150, you could think of it as maybe a little bit of algebra almost. You could think of it as like P plus P for a, a box of pages. And then half of P, so you end up with 2.5P. Now you might not like this method, but if you do it this way, you get something similar and you'd end up with 2.85P. Either way, you can see that we're gonna have a smaller number with off A. Ronnie is asked to work out the average number of orders per month last year. The table shows the number of orders each month. So we've got our 12 months of the year and the number of orders in each one. Work out both the median and the mode for Rani and give re one reason why the median is the better average for her to use. Right, well if we want the median, the best way to do it really is to sort them. So I'm going to look at these and I'm going to number them first to put them in order. So what's the smallest? 45 is the smallest. And we've got two of those, so one, two. What's the next smallest? 129. No, 125 is the next smallest, so that could be number three. Then 129. Then we've got any in the 30s? Yeah, but this is smaller, so that's the fifth smallest. Sixth smallest. What's the next smallest number? 148, 146, then 148, then we've got two in the 80s, so 9 and 10, then 11, and then 12. So now I'm going to write them all out in that order. So we've got 45, 45, 125, number 4 was 129, the fifth one was 132. 138, 146, what was the next smallest? 148. Now you can see how, because I numbered them first of all, it makes it easier for me to now write them all down in order. Otherwise it's very easy to get mixed up and realise that they're not all in increasing size, but they are. So we want the median, so we cross out the smallest and the largest. Next smallest, next largest. And we keep doing that until we're left with either one in the middle, or if we've got an even number, we're going to have two in the middle. So what we need to do with these is add them together and divide by two. So 138 plus 146, divide that by two, gives us 142. Now, by writing them out in order, it also makes it easiest easier for us to find the mode because the mode is the number that occurs the most or the thing that occurs the most. Now 45 I think is the only number that's repeated. So the mode is going to be 45. Okay now we've worked 
out both the median and the mode. Now we need to give a reason why the median is the better average for her to use. Well, I mean, we can see that they're very different. Now, if we use the mode, well, it's nowhere near most of the values. The median looks much more within uh, the majority of the values. So I would say median is better. And the reason I think it's better is because, well, every month has a different uh, number or a different amount, I suppose we can call it. Except for what were these months six and seven? So what we're saying is it's not really a mode. It's not like we had lots and lots that were coming up with the same value. I mean, it's it doesn't look conclusive to me. So I would say the median looks much better. And also, if we did worked out the mean. My feeling is that we get something that's a lot closer to the median than the mode as well. For E. The company's income in 2019 was £863,490. This was 7% higher than in 2018. Work out the company's income in 2018. Right. So 863,490. If that was 7% higher than 2018, well then let's think of 2018 as being the original amount, like 100%. So that means that this figure actually relates to 107%. So if we want to find out what 100% is, well then, we take this, we divide it by 107 to find out what 1% is, and then we multiply it by 100 to get to the original amount. So 8634.90 divided by 107 times 100, and we get 807,000. And finally, 4F. The company also prints t-shirts. Two elevenths of the t-shirts are white. One third of the remaining t-shirts are black. What is the ratio of white to black t-shirts? Okay. Uh, so if two shirts, two elevenths are white, one third of the remaining are black. Well, that's going to be one third. The remaining would be nine elevenths. Because if you think if two uh, two elements of t-shirts are, are, are white, so the remaining t-shirts is going to be let's say uh, so remaining would be one minus two over eleven, which you can think of like eleven over eleven minus two over eleven. So in other words, there's nine elevenths left. Now, if one third of those are black, we can do one third times nine over eleven. And when we're multiplying fractions, we just multiply the top and multiply the bottom. Thirty-three. Okay. So, what's the ratio of white to black T-shirts? Well, I'm going to draw a little table. White, we've got black, well white with 2 over 11, black 9 over 33. Now we can't really have fractions in our ratio, so uh, we want to get we want to get rid of these. So what we can do is uh, what's the best way to do this? We can kind of think of well actually the 9 over 33. These have got a common factor of 3, so 3 goes into 9 3 times, and 3 goes into 33, 11. 
So we've got two elevenths white and three elevenths black. Well, let's just multiply both of them by 11. Because if we do that, the 11 will cancel there. So 2 elevenths times 11, and if you don't believe me, we can do 2 divided by 11 times 11. Well, it's because the calculator is being silly with the rounding, but basically that's 2. And if we do the same over here, 11 times 3 over 11, we get 3. So basically our ratio is 2 to 3. And that's the end of the paper. So I hope you found it helpful. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, give me any comments, uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much.